right. Here we go. Okay. So we're we'll live. This is uh, Ask Us Anything. And really, we mean pretty much anything. So you know you can't make me blush. And I've never seen Boss blush. So you can ask the weirdest questions ever. <laughs> yeah. Plus, if I don't want to answer, I say, eh. Or you, or you give it to me. <laughs> or I give it to you. Yeah, you, yeah. you're good with everything. Anything so we've got a couple to start with. Tell me which you want yeah. to start with. So um, one of the first questions I got this week, and I wanted to save it for today, is something that you said, boss, which is that we lose lung capacity as we age. So can you talk, the person said, like, can boss talk about that a little bit more? So, yeah. Okay. So I, I thought I, I explained it in the video. So what happens is after the age of 28, uh, your your flex chestability starts to go down because of the calcification of the chest, and 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 that that will take you away. It's about what 30 milliliters a month. So what that will be in an entire year, or oh, no, per year. But mm -hmm. then in 10 years, that is already a can of a, a drink, like a coke can. That area already loses. That means in 30 years, three coke cans. That's a liter. Now, as a guy, you have six liters. So you lost one whole liter yeah. from your six liters. Unless, of course, you do breath work and you work those muscles and you keep those that those those uh, chest and the muscles in between the chest, you keep them flexible. It's very important. We were talking about it the last time. You know, for everybody who's doing endurance to the last week, I wouldn't do power training anymore, you know, because I would like to keep everything super relaxed and then start stretching your intercostal muscles like over all day long. I won't make them so super because the more you can expand your chest and how easier it is for you to expand your chest. Listen, your diaphragm is pushing it outside, right? Yep. If it's really tight, it's going to need a lot of power to push it out. But if it's really relaxed, it's like high kicks, right? If you're not really flexible, throwing high kicks is going to take you way more power than when you're super flexible because now it's much easier to bring that leg up. And see that mm -hmm. the same as with your chest. Uh, I so like that. I've never thought of it that way. I just I just came up with that. I, I go like, hey, that's a good one. You know, so there yeah. you go. <laughs> wow, that's excellent. So I think the, the, the takeaway is that you know, you are going to lose lung capacity. But what it is, is that your residual air actually um, increases. So your exhale gets worse. So your next inhale isn't as good. So the takeaway here is work on your exhale, make sure you're exhaling well. And remember, your body has to narrow to exhale well. So as you said, boss, is that if your rib cage is really rigid, your exhale is not going to be a good exhale. Therefore, your lung capacity is going to be less because you haven't exhaled well. And you'll see this. You'll see, especially guys walk around, they've got barreled chests and like they look really strong. But every time I see someone with a barreled chest, all I can think about is, oh, my gosh, so much residual air in that body that they're probably breathing faster than they should be because the breaths are small. So um, keep your rib cage super, super flexible. Um, really work on your rotation. And we do twists. It's just make sure you're twisting a lot. Make sure you're twisting all day long wherever you are. But there you go. Just make sure this is really super flexible. We do um, an intercostal stretch this way. We do twists this way. Make sure when you twist, you're not twisting at the waist. You're actually twisting from your rib cage up. So that's a really important one. Um, you know, we're all aging regardless of the age you're at. Uh, let me give you the second question. Oh, wait, 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 one second. Oh, yeah. give, me, give me one second because I'm, I'm just thinking about this because maybe you asked the question for that because I thought I explained everything in the in the... Um, in the, in the clip that I sent, but what I didn't say is how breathing works. Because if you, if he believes, if people believe at home that your lungs are doing the work, that's that's not the case. Mm -hmm. Your yeah. lungs open up by chest expansion. You expand your, uh, you expand your chest, and there's a vacuum between your body and your lungs, and that vacuum will open up your lungs. So your lungs have no muscle. The only yeah. way for you to open up your lungs is by chest expansion. You see, and now if that now you see if that chest expansion goes down, yes, you can pull in uh, less air. Now your lungs don't really shrink, I would say, right? Because it's your no. chest that's doing it. But if you start training those muscles that can expand the chest, like your yeah. diaphragm and your intercostals, which are the muscles in between your ribs, then you can bring them completely back again. So now yeah. you know how breathing works, because otherwise it makes no sense. You're gonna go, wait yeah. a minute, why am I losing it? It's because yeah. your chest is the way to open up your lungs. Yeah, yeah. So that's thoracic. Um, Flexibility is really key. It's so important. And no one thinks about 
your rib cage being flexible in your lungs, they think about it as being two separate things, like your lungs somehow pump on their own. And like, no, like you said, bosses, like they don't pump on their own. They pump because of the muscles opening up the rib cage and then the rib cage closing and your whole body flattening. So I know that's a really simple concept, but I know I find it kind of mind blowing is that that's how your lungs work is by the muscles that surround your rib cage. So pretty yes. awesome. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so we had another question on the difference between breathing um, for meditation and breathing for exercise or at the gym. You want to try that one out? Yeah. So for, first of all, yeah, the goals are different, right? Uh, you, if you want to relax, you relax it for training. Well, you, you want to work out there. You want to get a better stamina. You want to make train those, all those muscles. You want to make them, um, how you say, so, so they memorize everything. How's efficient. You want to make your muscles efficient because that's literally the reason why your stamina increases. If you work a muscle over and over again, it becomes more efficient. Does it uses less oxygen? Hey, and there you increase your volume, your, your stamina. So the two things are completely different. One is to calm down, and the other one is actually to bring your heart rate up. But the breathing, optical of, of diaphragmatic breathing, is of course always good. You know, deep in and out. But the more you expand your air, like if I'm on a bag, of course I've got to start breathing faster. Now I used to breathe really freaking fast because I was breathing wrong. <laughs> I was breathing like this. That I don't have anymore. So now you come out and even. Like meditation is like most of the time when you want to meditate, you want to have an inhale, let's say a four second inhale and then a six or eight second exhale. You want to slow down on the exhale. If you can start vibrating with it, this is something I like to do. Um, then you also start humming and humming is also something that you can yeah. use to, 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 uh, to affect your vagus nerve. The vagus nerve is what they say in Latin then is a nerve that controls pretty much any physiological action in the human body, even blinking your eyes and breathing, stuff that you don't know, but you're, you're doing automatically. And that nerve also calms you down and because it drops your cortisol levels. And because of course, the cortisol levels get dropped because it slows your heart rate and it slows your blood pressure. So once you start deep diaphragmatic breathing, that is all going to calm down. Now, that's meditation, of course. I would say in training... Yeah, that's different. It's deep diaphragmatic breathing, but then the exhales and inhales are pretty much at the same time, mm -hmm. you know, but not too fast. And you always like to breathe diaphragmatically. You're sure when you have to breathe fast, yes, less is going to happen. But still, <sighs> that's still pretty fast. And I think that if I come out of a hard round nowadays, that's yeah. not even the speed that I do anymore. It's yeah. like literally... <sighs> And that's after a hard round coming out. And in the early days, it was <laughs> it was really super yeah. fast. So it's a big difference. But the inhale is shorter than the exhale in meditation. I hope Dr. Well, Blizzard is going to correct me if I did something wrong. <laughs> and with uh, with if you're a working out, I would say the inhale and exhale are as long. But then again, if you, for instance, go after come after a hard round, you go back to your corner. It's really good for you to breathe in and a little bit slower out. So to keep that air a little bit more in the lungs, you see. So we actually did the whole course. We did Breathing for Warriors. That's a course we did. And we're talking about that. It's targeted breathing. And that's breathing at any moment into the fight. Like first in the dressing room, you breathe different than once you're in the ring. And once you're in the ring, you're still breathing kind of calm and relaxed. But as soon as you start fighting, and let's say you're two feet away from each other, that's you have you breathe a certain way. The closer you come, the more different you start breathing. And we break everything down. And it sounds very complicated, but a lot of people do it naturally already. And those mm -hmm. are the really good fighters. Mm -hmm. But you can really learn from it. You know, once, once you know when and where to start breathing a certain way, your stamina goes up so much more. Yeah. It's dramatic. Yeah, dramatic. So uh, we're getting some good questions coming in. So you might want to take a look at those, but I'll just put in my two cents about that is that you said this boss, which is that when you're breathing for meditation and you're breathing for performance or for exercise, the goals are different. So when you're breathing for meditation, you are trying to get into a trance state where your breathing is as slow and deep as possible. And the goal is to get your brain waves to get into that state of calmness that is trancey. Um, and that is part of recovery. When you get there, your body calms down, your cortisol comes down, your whole body gets to go into healing. Now, when you are working out to exercise or uh, to train, to perform, you are then using breathing muscles that you have made strong. 
So you've worked out your breathing muscles so that they're strong, 10 pounds of breathing muscle. Um, so that's completely different. There, the training that you've done um, outside the ring is what's important. So you've worked on your breathing muscles so that they don't tire, so that they don't give you, you know, that feeling of being heavy in your body is when all the blood is starting to shunt away from your arms and legs and go to your heart and your breathing muscles. If your breathing muscles are strong, that's not going to happen as quickly. So when you're working out, um, you are using the breath um, as a mechanical thing that is paired with a movement, or you're working out your breathing muscles separately so that fatigue is delayed, it's called in, in all the literature. So um, two different reasons with two different results, uh, but it's a really good question. Yeah. Okay. You see anything you like in the questions? Oh, uh, are there exercises to strengthen the exhale muscles? I see that. Joshua Raff, he was talking about it. Yes. I actually just put a video out. I put two caps on a note to trainer and I was showing that. But Dr. Belize has a really cool and I like even better this you're holding two balloons. You know, and you're just uh, breathing up, blowing up the balloon. And then while you, while this one is full, you push it away. You start blowing this yeah. one up and you let this one go again. Don't let it loose because it's going to fly away. And there's guys who did, what is the record now? How many balloons like a Jake? Uh, we did, um, well, the exhale pulsations was Jake Ellenberger at 750. The 750 balloons. exhale pulsations. Guys. I know. I think he could, I think he's beat it now as well i think we're over a thousand but that's <laughs> the last time we did it you know in an olympic setting the balloons uh 150 in half an hour was the last time we did a really long session however we did a 10 minute one and there was 50 balloons in 10 minutes now if you guys want to try this uh exercise with the balloons and the exhale muscles please 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 make sure that you are breathing correctly with the right muscles before you start blowing up balloons, because otherwise you're going to be working out muscles that aren't your primary breathing muscles. So once you start doing this, that's, you know, you're not working out the right muscles and, and you're just actually overworking muscles that are um, not relevant or already kind of pissed off. So when you're doing the balloons, and again, boss said it, I like to have two balloons. You're doing rock and roll where you're inhaling and you're expanding forwards. And when you exhale, you squeeze. It's kind of like doing cat cow and yoga, inhale and exhale. And when you exhale, you obviously blow into the balloon and you're using your core to squeeze. I don't mean just your abs. So this is your abs. Um, I mean, you're using your, um, your obliques you're using all the muscles around your body and you can even squeeze your pelvic floor and really get the air out and feel your body contracting. You blow up one balloon, you switch to the other one, you let the air out of this one and that way you can continue. So again, the number, if you're good at this, I mean, be gentle is that you have to be good at your form when you do this is that, um, get to the point where you can do this for 10 minutes and count how many balloons you can do. And then, you know, get your buddies together and uh, compete because that always makes things um, a lot more fun and you do a lot better. I, I was just thinking about uh, if you have one of those rides when you go into like a freaking, you know, you know, those rides, they have those things that you can push down on you, right? Yeah. Yeah. So now you can't raise your shoulders. That will be yeah. a great instrument to have when you do the balloons. Or think about like the, the old school calf machines. You remember those? Oh, yes. Also. Yeah. yeah. Step on there. Yeah, you put them on, and that way you you feel when you're using your shoulders. Yeah. Um, I know that uh, Danny Massa, who is um, a big fan, he's on Survivor right now, uh, actually takes kettlebells, not super heavy ones. He holds them at his side, yep. he puts the uh, O2 trainer in, and he actually works the O2 trainer while holding kettlebells to keep his shoulders down, which is super cool. Yeah. yeah, you showed that to a Joey Diaz and myself. Remember all the way back at my gym a long time ago. Oh my ago. gosh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, Millions that was crazy. Ago. So freaking crazy Joey, he's so awesome, right? Oh, he's so awesome. Yeah, yeah. we should have him on. We should yes. have him on. Um, okay, let's pick another question. Um, um, let me see what we got. Save this live video after airing. Yes, we're going to save this live video after airing. 
Okay, boss, I'm with the Franklin Jiu Jitsu Club. I want to ask you for your help in advertising the show. Oh, here goes a boom. Something different. I will come talk to Ben. Okay, Jason Remy just uh, sent an email to Jack at bossrooten.com and he will forward it to me. Jack at bossrooten.com. Do you see anything, Doc? Yeah. So I've got a sigh here, Stockbridge. Um, I can't seem to catch a deep breath. Um, so there's two things I would tell you. Uh, one is take your breathing IQ, because often when you can't catch your breath, it's that your mechanics are bad. It's sort of like, you know, I've plateaued on my squat um, and you look at your mechanics and your mechanics are off. Of course, you can't actually add more weight. So get your breathing IQ, thebreathingiq.com. And the other thing is exhale. So I'm a, I'm a really big believer of the exhale because I see so many people that aren't exhaling well. And then when they go to inhale, they don't have a lot of space to inhale. Then they don't exhale well. And this goes on and on. And then the rate of your breathing goes up. And then you get anxious and the whole thing spirals into a just big mess. So uh, that's the clinical term. Yep. So <laughs> the two things, get your breathing IQ. And, and right now is actually go ahead and exhale hard. If this is not happening to you guys, this is what it feels like. So what I want you to do is take a big inhale, right? Big belly breath. And now exhale like halfway. And then take a big inhale and exhale halfway. And you'll notice that you start to feel like you can't get a big breath, like you start feeling air hunger, um, what's called dyspnea. And, and it's not because you, you can't take a deep breath, it's because you haven't exhaled. So now actually exhale completely, big inhale, exhale psh, completely, squeeze, now take a big breath. You're like, oh, that's a big breath. So empty first. That's my, uh, that's my um, advice to sigh. Well, the more clean air you can get, fresh air in your lungs, the better, right? So if you decide to blow out 80%, well, you can only fill it back up with 80% of good air. Boom. I got one for you. That's it. You got one for me. Okay. Yeah, Midwest Picker, boss. I'm 57 years old, and my doc said I'm in perfect cardiopulmonary health. Do I still need to do respiratory exercises? 100%. That is the first question we started with. Because if you didn't, if you breathe incorrect, which 95% of the people are doing, so if you stand in front of the mirror and you take a deep breath and you see yourself doing this, yes, you're really going to need it. Because like we talked about, your chest flexibility, thoracic flexibility, that's the beautiful word of it, starts to decline. That means if it can't expand as much anymore, you can't fill up your lungs. So you need to do breath work. You need to attack your breathing muscles to get that back up. But most importantly, what we also talked about Get your chest flexible. Start stretching your chest muscles. This is one of the most important things. I had no clue about breathing, but all the way back when I was competing and I was breathing wrong. But the one thing that I did in the dressing room, because it would always feel that I was breathing easier. And now I know what I was doing. I had a, my, my trainer or my trainer, my manager. I never had a coach. He would put his back against my back. We would hook arms and then he would lean forward. So I would lean backwards and it would actually stretch my upper body. I thought I was stretching my abs and that made me feel good. But what I was doing was also stretching my intercostal muscles, not knowing that if they're loose, it's easier for me to breathe. So you see, I knew that it made me feel, made me breathe easier. I just didn't know why. And that's why I also went at the boss with the neck crank. I stopped somebody from expanding his chest. Now I understand what I was. I knew I was suffocating him because I could hear it. He would have, you know, and then they would tap. But I didn't know the mechanics. Now I know that, well, if you can't expand your chest, you can't breathe. So that move, you can hold for as long as you can hold your breath. If you just took a big, big gulp of breath, I just squeeze it on. And as soon as he exhales, he can't inhale anymore. You see, so I was doing things correct. I only didn't know why. <laughs> that was the big difference. And now I know. Yeah. So actually, I want to go back to Midwest Picker. Um, is that I am really skeptical when a doc tells you that you're in perfect health. Um, because that's probably not really true. It's probably perfect as per um, their tests given your age. So you're probably within the normal range. And to me, within normal is not good enough because in general, if you look at what normal is nowadays, it's actually pretty shitty. So um, your doc saying you're, you're in perfect health, I would really want to know what those numbers are that you're perfect. And are you perfect for 57? Because 
you may want to be better than what's expected for a 57 year old. So um, I would actually get your numbers and the numbers that you want to look at, you want to look at your FVC. That's your um, vital lung capacity, um, FVC. You want to look at FEV1. That is your um, the speed of your exhale. So those two are really important. And then your breathing IQ. So those are the three sort of most practical, most important uh, metrics you can have. So get those and then start looking to see, you know, are they perfect? I really doubt that they're perfect. There's always something you can do to make them better. So for instance, with the breathing IQ, the breathing IQ looks at location, like where you breathe from, and then it looks at range of motion. And you can be an A at 100 range of motion. And again, when you do the breathing IQ, this will make sense. But I actually have a guy who got to 200%. So almost 200%. So meaning that he's double what an A is, obviously, but he's able to expand tremendously and then narrow tremendously. So you can always get better. And if a doc tells you you're within normal range, you're good, get your numbers and and do a little studying because the probability that you're perfect um, is pretty low. There's always work you can do, especially around breathing, because we haven't been good about uh, educating people about breathing and aging um, until right now. <laughs> well, if, if we, we were in this stage, you, you were, you're working with SEALs, right? Yeah. And what, yeah. what happened yesterday when you were working with SEALs? Yeah. Well, I had 80 guys. Uh, uh, I was on base. It's called the grinder, uh, appropriately called the grinder. And um, you can go online and Google the grinder. There's a video that shows you where that place place is. And there was less breathing mechanic dysfunction. But, you know, still we had paradoxical breathers. Uh, still we had guys who had questions about wanting their breath hold to be longer, wanting to be able to recover more quickly, so on and so forth. But um, we, I actually had one of the questions I really liked yesterday, we can use this one, is I had a guy uh, right in the first row and he said, if a vertical breath is dysfunctional, why does it feel so good? So, and I loved that question. It was one of my favorite questions of the day. And that has to do with sort of the psychology of breathing. That's is it. There, yeah. That's it. Yeah. Yeah. So you have millions of reps where you go take that big breath, you put your shoulders back, you go up, and you usually think, you know, uh, something good. So you do that enough and you pair this movement with the thought that you're having, which is, it's a beautiful day. Um, I'm so glad that's over with, whatever it is that you're thinking. So it has to do with having had that many reps and a positive thought that every time you do this, you think, um, wow, that feels really good. And you happen to be stretching. So usually we walk around really braced. So when you do this, it's a stretch and it's gonna feel good. Yeah, and the mind is everything. Whatever you put in your mind, you believe. Like I, I just heard the thing, you know, people wanna stop smoking, but it's so difficult, it's so difficult. You know what companies are telling you it's so difficult? Those are the smoking companies. And the reason they do that, they tell you that because now it's in your head and then you think, oh, it's so hard to quit, it's hard to quit and they try. And that is why it's very hard for people to quit. But if you don't ever wake up after eight hours of sleeping and you're shaking in bed, right? Because of you didn't smoke, it's really not that hard, but you can mentally oversue it. They, they tell you it's hard. The, the, the mind is everything. I give you an example. It's because it's a cool example. I really thought I'm, a, I'm training with uh, Hector Pena. He's a uh, really good striker. Unfortunately, he passed away. He's a close friend of mine. And uh, he had to fight a guy who was very famous for low kicks. And this guy is a Terminator, uh, Hector Pena. And he's training with me and he, keep, he's, he keeps going full. I go, this is a week before the fight. I say, dude, slow down, you know, because you're pissing me off and I'm going to fight back. You know, I don't want to do that. Don't want to get injured. But he kept going, kept going. And I warned him one more time. And suddenly I just kicked him really hard in the leg. And immediately he goes, oh, crap. And now it's the training is over and his slack is done. So he goes, what am I going to do? And I'm standing there. I go, oh, crap. I say, you know what? It's okay. I will, uh, I'll make sure he's not going to low kick you. And he says, how are you going to do that? I said, leave that over to me. And we go to the fight. 
And I asked the doctor, I asked the promoter, where is his opponent warming up? I knocked on the door. His opponent opens the door. I go, oh, crap, you're warming up here? He goes, yeah. I said, yeah, we needed to warm up. He says, boss, it's okay because I used to train with Hector and everything will be okay. I say, I understand that. I said, but we found some really good counters for your low kicks and I don't want you to see those. I said, I'll find another place. That's the only thing I said. I We found some really good counters for your low kicks. And then I just waved it off and I walked out. And in his mind, he, he didn't throw one low kick in the whole fight. Well, the fight was only one and a half round but <laughs> because he got knocked out. But he didn't throw a low kick because in his mind, I paid in the picture for him that it's going to, if he gives a low kick, he's going to get knocked out. And because of that, he didn't do it. You see, that should tell you what you can do with your mind and how you can influence people. And this is what Dr. Blizz is talking about. You, whatever you can do, you can do it yourself. But you got to overcome it. Um, Ross, there's a lot of fight questions, which I love as well, not to answer, but to listen to you. Um, there's one that says it may be related to breathing or not. Uh, how do I not get cramped up when want, uh, wanting to fight? Maybe that's waiting to fight. Do you have any ideas for that? You mean cramped up like from nerves like that? I think so. Yeah. It's peeled. Yeah. yeah. Again, you know, it's it's like when I talked about, uh, you remember the opening when I talked about the Vargas nerve and, and how to focus that? I used to do that in the dressing room. I And again, I had no clue what I was doing, but I, I made my, my body vibrate. In and on. And if you do a low, low hum, first of all, you feel your stomach vibrate and it feels good in the stomach. That's why I was doing it. What I didn't know is that these long exhales and then humming and singing is also stimulating the vagus nerves. You see, so I was unknowingly doing something right. Yeah. And that would always calm me down. And you can do that as well. And and in your mind, go over this. If your opponent, like a week before the fight, if you guys get thrown in a room and they lock the room and nobody can watch the fight, you guys fight. And after you fought, none of you are allowed to say who won. Would you care if you would lose? Now, I've never heard about a person say, yeah, I would care. Because everybody says, no, it could, could have not been my day. Yeah, so that means that you're not fighting for yourself. That means that you're fighting to please the people. And once you start doing that and your family members and everybody is there, yeah, that will get you very nervous, you know, because if you tell told everybody that you're going to kick his ass and he's not good, well, now you better do what you said. You see, so don't put that pressure on you. You know, forget about people. They will always complain. It doesn't matter if you do right or wrong. It doesn't matter. There's always people who annoy you, you know, and we always pick the one or two out that we think that's the majority, but it's not. It's never. It's a very small percentage. So if you truly can master, and this is the one thing that I could master, I, I wish I could master it with everything else because it will help me with everything else as well. But the fighting, I was just didn't give a crap about what everybody would tell. And, and because of that, I had zero pressure and I was just fighting, you know. And then, of course, it depends how many fights you had. If you just into your th third, fourth fight, yeah, you still might have some nerves. But that also will go away. Don't put too much pressure on yourself because the more you put on, the worse it's going to be. And if you have really problems with pressure, I would not even tell anybody in your town that you're going to fight and fight mm -hmm. out of state. And don't tell anybody. And then if you win, you come back and you can say, hey, I just want to fight. And if you lose, nobody knows. So there's way less pressure. Try that. I love that. I think you could probably have that as a metaphor to other things as well. Just translate it to the rest of your life. That's mm. it. You know, but I couldn't, I cannot do it. Like for auditions, for instance, if you go to an audition for a movie and it's a big movie, those are so nerve wracking to me because everything is in that one and a half minute or even maybe it's just a minute that you have to do, but everything needs to be perfect. And I wish that I could completely do what I was doing in fighting, but somehow... Then again, I didn't do as many uh, auditions. So it's not like fighting. I did a lot, you know, so you get used to it as well. So maybe I should simply do more auditions. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So um, we have uh, two minutes left. If you have asked a question and we haven't gotten to it, just put it on one of our Facebook pages, um, Bosses, Mine, Breathing for Warriors, if we didn't get to your question. Um, and we will be back doing this again sometime soon. We'll let you know about it. Um, some really nice questions in here today. Boss, it was great seeing you. And uh, we're going to sign off for today. Do we get some music for leaving? Music. I don't know. Maybe? Sure, huh? I don't know if we've got that organized yet. All right. Thanks for your questions. Thanks for coming on. And we'll see you soon. I heard some music.